Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ty Gregory, uh, and I'm proud to serve as the new executive director of JCRC. I'm not sure how many months I can keep using the word new, but I'm still using it. Um, thank you for joining us. This is a very contentious and important issue facing our state and our community and, and many of our neighbors. So with that, I'd like to get started first by sharing a little bit about what JCRC has been up to and is advocating for in regards to California Ethnic Studies model curriculum. And then I'm gonna turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Jessica Tribowicz, to uh, introduce our speaker. So listen, we're focused on three main things. Number one, we support the traditional curriculum of ethnic studies, which is historically focused on four key constituencies, African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, and Native Americans. It's no surprise that each of these communities has been in crisis over the past several months, and we need to honor and respect the fact that this education is an important form of social justice, uh, a form of social justice that's been born out of the civil rights movement that we need to include in our public schools. And our Jewish values compel us to teach our kids about the experiences and contributions of each of these groups um, in our state and in our country. In our webinar today, we're gonna have Assembly Member Medina highlight the history and theory of ethnic studies and why it's so critical to these communities and how our community and particularly parents of students in public schools should think about ethnic studies in, in the classroom. Number two, we were disturbed and concerned by some of the references that we felt were anti-Semitic and in support of the Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement, BDS, in the draft last time. So any anti-Semitic characterizations and stereotypes based on religion, culture, ethnicity, practices, along with references to BDS are unacceptable from our point of view and should be removed from the next draft. Additionally, we think that anti-Semitism should be added to forms of oppression listed in the ESMC alongside other terms for groups experiencing discrimination, be it racism, sexism, classism, homotransphobia, xenophobia, etc. Number three, the Jewish community, like many other communities, are marginalized groups that are not part of these traditional constituencies. We recognize that for our community and for these other communities, we are looking for meaningful inclusion. And what we define meaningful inclusion is content about our identity, our shared history, literature, traditions, culture, and religion, things that unite our community, something that notes our struggles and our successes, and highlights the diversity that exists within our community and with these others. Um, this may or may not happen through ethnic studies. There are other outlets for us to tell our story. And like these four communities, our community is also in crisis. Poway happened not too long ago. Pittsburgh happened not too long ago. We understand why this is a palatable topic, and we at JCRC are committed to making sure that this is something that is taught in our schools. And we would like to thank Tony Thurman, the Superintendent of Public Instruction, for his leadership throughout this process. He's been an important partner, and we trust that he and his team are working to make many of these things happen. And I'm happy to report as of recently in a conversation with him, that he's committed to immediately working with us and other Jewish partner agencies to bring lessons on anti-Semitism and Jewish identity to California public schools. And we look forward to bringing all of you into that conversation. Lastly, I just wanna remind everybody that this is a long-term effort. No matter what happens with the draft, whether it's a perfect draft that meets all of our goals or whether it falls short, that we're gonna to continue to need to advocate together in each of the school districts. Each school district gets to make its own decision about how this is implemented. And that's why our work with local and state elected officials, school board members, and, and many of you who are parents of students at these schools, that's why our relationship building is so critical um, because we're gonna to need to make sure that this is implemented in a way that our community can be proud of, as well as these four traditional communities. So, as we lead up to the August 3rd date, which is when we expect this draft to come up, we anticipate being in touch with all of you, uh, as well as elected officials in the assembly, of course, and elsewhere, um, to make sure that our community's point of view is being heard. So with that, I'm not the star of the show, so I'd like to turn it over to Jessica Trubowicz, our fantastic director of public policy, to kick things off. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Ty, um, and welcome Assemblymember Medina. 
going to say a few brief words of introduction. Um, Assemblymember Medina was elected in November 2012 to represent California's 61st Assembly District, which consists of Riverside, Moreno Valley, Paris, and Mead Valley. He currently serves as the chair of the Assembly Committee on Higher Education. A former educator, Mr. Medina cares deeply about education and works to champion policies that improve the lives of students across the state. He believes an educated workforce is critical to the success of California. Mr. Medina is the author of Assembly Bill 331, which would require one semester of ethnic studies for all California high school students. He is an active member of the Jewish Legislative Caucus and has been a great friend to JCRC and to JPAC over the years. I can recall sitting his, in his office just last year, sharing our concerns about the ethnic studies model curriculum and his immediate, was response, his immediate response was, let's get this right. Uh, and he followed up with his actions. So I'm thrilled to be talking um, with him today about something he, we know he is very passionate about, ethnic studies. But before we begin, a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and we will have it posted uh, and shared through JCRC. We'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A with the audience at the end of this session. So if you have questions, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your page and type in your question. Um, I will hand it over to my colleague, Karen Stiller, for the last 15 minutes and she'll facilitate the Q&A discussion. So I'm gonna get us started and hand it over to Assemblymember Medina uh, for some introductory remarks. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, and thank you for having me here uh, this morning. Uh, it, it really is an honor to be here with you, uh, with you uh, in the Jewish Community Relations Council. And before uh, we kind of started on, on ethnic studies, I just wanted to say a few brief remarks of where I am sitting right now. I, I am sitting at my home, at my uh, dinner table, across the street from Poly High School, where I taught for 20 years. And also across the street from Poly High School is Temple Bethel, the, the first uh, synagogue in the city of Riverside, uh, where I was a member, where I was a member for many years, where my two children uh, went to uh, Sunday school, uh, did their bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah there as well. But it was also a place where neo-Nazis came uh, and stood with swastika flags uh, during uh, Sabbath services, uh, not too many years ago. Uh, here in Riverside that I represent, uh, students uh, just last year, students at Martin Luther King High School uh, took a picture holding a swastika and a Confederate flag, uh, which was you know, very, very troubling um, to our community. This is also the community when, when, when the school district went to name uh, Martin Luther King High School, parents went to testify at the school board meeting that they felt that naming the school Martin Luther King would be detrimental to the future of their kids because when uh, colleges would receive their transcripts, um, they, they would think that it was a quote unquote ghetto school. My children, didn't attend the high school that I taught at, Riverside Poly High School. They attended Rubido High School. And I can remember my son uh, attending that high school and having one of his classmates put a swastika on his backpack. A a as it is, most of uh, the Jewish community uh, students, I would say, attended the high school where I taught, Riverside Poly. Uh, but my children went to a different high school uh, Rubido High School. So I say that to put kind of uh, in context where I am coming from, my own experience, the experience of this community, which, which has been troubling um, history. Uh, you know, we also had the same uh, neo-Nazis uh, uh, rally in front of the Home Depot, uh, uh, supposedly uh, voicing their uh, displeasure of day workers. Uh, this is also the community that witnessed the, uh, the, the shooting of Taisha Miller, 
a young African-American woman who was shot by Riverside police 21 times as she sat unconscious in her car. So I've been a member of this community for a long time. Uh, I'm proud to represent Riverside. And as I said, I was a teacher at, at Riverside Poly High School for 20 some years. And among the subjects that I taught were ethnic studies and Chicano studies. And with that, I will turn it over to Jessica. Thank you. Wow, okay, thank you for setting the context and, and setting the tone. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, but I, I'd wanna start out on the question of ethnic studies, if you just explain just a little bit of background about how it got started um, and what is taught in the course. Right. Well, I, I think that ethnic studies um, as, a, as, a, as a discipline, as a subject, uh, has a history of a little over 50 years. I believe last year uh, it, it, it celebrated 50 years of a, of a discipline, of a subject, where it, it started at San Francisco State, you know, not too far from where you all are, mm -hmm. at San Francisco State College, when the groups that Ty mentioned, uh, African Americans, Latino, Asian Americans, and Native Americans, demanded, you know, demanded that, that, that uh, higher education uh, look at the experience of these four groups that had not ever really been included, I, I would say, in, 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 uh, in any study. You know, I, I, I was a history major at UC Riverside. Um, and I remember going to school. Uh, you know, I graduated high school in 1971, uh, high school. And my own uh, 12 years of schooling, uh, starting from the early 1960s, uh, until I got to college, there was no mention very, you know, I could hardly remember, I, I can hardly remember any instance of any uh, mention of any of the four groups, really, uh, that, that I just mentioned. Uh, it, it, it was, as everyone is aware, you know, a, a time in American history uh, with the civil rights movement that people were you know, demanding and changing American society. And with that change in American society came the call for ethnic studies. And I do remember being a young person uh, growing up in Ojai, California, a little town, and my father pointing out the articles in the newspapers where places like San Francisco State and San Jose State College were in the forefront of uh, the ethnic studies, Mexican-American studies, black studies uh, curriculum. So that was the beginning. And I, I, I would say that it was later on, um, and, and maybe, maybe even 20 some years later, that I started seeing as an educator um, the call for ethnic studies in, in the schools. Uh, and, and I was fortunate that in my district, uh, because students uh, walked out of class, boycotted uh, ethnic studies, African American studies, Chicano studies, um, were implemented in my school district and I got the chance to teach it. So I, I think that's a little bit about the history of uh, ethnic studies, how it came about. Thank you, and, and yesterday I had the opportunity to um, catch a little bit of the webinar you were part of with um, Superintendent Tony Thurman, where you were focused, I believe, on just the discussion around Chicana studies, but we heard from many students talking about the value of ethnic studies to them in their personal lives. Um, and so I wonder if you want to share any of your experience teaching it or possibly um, if you had any conversations about um, ethnic studies with your children who are Latino Jews and how they may have experienced it. Right. Well, you know, I think identity, our own identity, is certainly something that is important to all of us and important to, to young people and how we form that identity. And what do we know? And as my own children grew up, as you said, Jessica, uh, both Latino and Jewish, uh, my wife and I, you know, made it a point to to celebrate both. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, they grew up here in Temple Bethel, um, and so, and we you know, we we um, sent them to Sunday school and bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah. 
And I, I think that is important. It, it's important for all children, uh, no matter where they come from, to, to have a sense of who they are. Uh, that, that is why ethnic studies is so important because growing up here, my son, you know, in the United States, uh, son of an immigrant, my parents came to California from Panama. Uh, as, as Ty mentioned, uh, we, we see a lot of derogatory information or a lot of misinformation, uh, low expectations. Uh, certainly when I uh, started going to college in the early 1970s, you know, if, if we looked at UCLA at that time and, uh, and, and we looked at the number of Latino or African-American students at UCLA, it was only a handful. Uh, when, when I started college at Purdue University in Indiana in 1971, I was one of 50 Latino students at, at Purdue University in 1971. So the message that students get, or that young people, children, get from their parents is, is very important. And unfortunately, uh, some of that, like I said, can be stereotypical, uh, low, low expectations, of, of teachers, of the educational system as a whole. Um, and, and so it is important that not only parents, but the schools not give that kind of information, uh, but, but give the correct information uh, to all its students. And I think that is a part of ethnic studies that is so valuable. And it was my experience. It was my experience as an ethnic studies, Chicano studies teacher, what a difference that those kind of classes, the information and the, what they were exposed to and able to explore made a difference in my students' lives. And, and I repeat often that the students that I taught uh, continue to be grateful for that experience. And I know that it had a, a, a big impact on their lives. And, and I know, as I mentioned earlier, you're the author of, of AB331, which would make it um, a mandatory course in high school. Um, do you want to say anything about, um, about the bill or what motivated you to, to make it uh, mandatory in high school? Yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly, you know, the 50 years of ethnic studies history, the 50 years of scholarship, right? The 50 years of knowledge that has been created, produced. Uh, by scholars, uh, you know, throughout the United States, um, is is troubling that we don't include that new research, that new knowledge that's been created uh, in our curriculum uh, in in K twelve. So uh, I, I um, you know, followed on the on the heels and the efforts of uh, my colleague Luis Alejo, who called for the creation of the curriculum and saying that it is unacceptable uh, to look at a U.S. history book uh, that I taught. I also taught U.S. history in the 11th grade, world history in the 9th grade, and not see anything at, at all or one page on, on maybe Cesar Chavez and Martin Luther King, and that, that is it. So I, I very much said that that is an ex unacceptable, that we cannot say that we are an educated society if we don't know about our, the history of the groups that, uh, that make up our society. And I think that is what uh, motivated me to uh, ask that uh, ethnic studies be a graduation requirement in the state of California. So I've heard um, you know, a couple of, of, some, of some real concerns, some, some valid concerns about ethnic studies. Um, and want to ask you a couple questions that relate to those concerns. Um, first of all, what do you think of the idea, many people have stated that it doesn't need to be an ethnic studies course, that it needs to be included throughout the curriculum, and that we shouldn't just make it a course, but we need to work harder to, to integrate all this type of learning in all of the other classes. You know, I, I, I don't disagree that uh, this curriculum should be integrated throughout the curriculum. Um, 
when I got my credential, my teaching credential in 1975, it was a bilingual, bicultural credential. And the idea of bilingual education came out of a case, uh, Lou, I think Lao, rather, Lao versus the state of California in San Francisco with the Chinese community, that if we provided education in, in a language that the students did, under, did not understand, um, you know, we were not really giving them an education. And that was, a, 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 I think, a Supreme Court decision that brought on bilingual education. Uh, and that bilingual bicultural education uh, went through from uh, first grade, you know, at least through sixth grade and was supposed to be integrated in the curriculum. Uh, that, that is certainly the best way to, to teach our history and culture. But as Dr. Weber, who also introduced a bill to make ethnic studies a requirement in the CSU, and whose bill has gotten all the way past the Senate now, and I have discussed, and as I stated at the outset, it has now been 50 years. It has been 50 years since there's been ethnic studies. You know, the amount of research, wealth of information, uh, scholarship that has been created in those 50 years has been there, but in those 50 years, I would say we haven't seen it included in the K-12. And I would say that I don't wanna see us being in the same place in the, another 50 years and still waiting for uh, inclusion in curriculum. So that, that is, I think, what I would say to that argument. Some citizens have raised the concern about political indoctrination in ethnic studies classroom, um, and in the first draft of the first model of the first draft of the model curriculum, um, how, what do you think about the role of politics in the classroom, and how would you respond to those concerns? Yeah, you know, as a teacher for thirty-four years, I, I would I would say that it is impossible to keep politics out of the classroom. And, 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 and in my own history, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the legislature now uh, after uh, 34 years of teaching. And, and the, the difference I say that politics uh, now is in the open, whether in politics before it was sort of uh, more hidden. Because what, what we teach is a political uh, decision, right? What we teach is a political decision. Um, who our teachers are, uh, you know, who, who's standing in front of the classroom. Those, those are kind of political decisions. Um, so I, I, I would say that it is very, would be very difficult for any, you know, any social studies curriculum not to have one slant or another. And certainly, uh, and I, you know, I, I'm kind of old school, so I don't use the, the language uh, that, that some, many young people use, you know, about white supremacy. Um, but I, I, I am more familiar with the language of ethnocentrism and Eurocentrism. And that certainly is the curriculum that we've taught for many, many years. Um, the New York Times reporter posed to me a similar question to me about ethnic studies. Um, and I say good education, good education, no matter what it is, no matter what the subject is, allows the student to draw conclusions. It, 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 otherwise, yes, it's not education. It, it would be indoctrination. But I would say that ethnic studies like US history or world history or English, the material can be presented and allow the students to draw their own conclusions, but to be given the facts, you know, given the, a more fuller uh, story of what has been U.S. California history, and uh, and let the students draw their own conclusions. No, don't. It it should not be uh, a class where the conclusions are made for them. Are you concerned that some groups, some ethnic groups, um, won't feel reflected in ethnic studies? Um, and what would you say to to those students, the majority of ethnic groups in in California? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I think that's, uh, there, there, there's some irony there, 
no doubt. I, I cannot, uh, you know, I can't uh, avoid seeing the irony uh, because uh, certainly not every single, uh, you know, I mean, a, a classroom of, of my students uh, at Riverside Poly High School would, would, would include more than just students from the four groups that we talked about, that we said are the four pillars of ethnic studies historically. Mm -hmm. But as a, uh, a professor of mine at, at UC Riverside, Dr. Carlos Cortez uh, emphasizes, uh, I think good education brings in all the students and, and as family history is so important to ethnic studies, certainly there would be opportunity for other students to go outside of those four ethnic, uh, ethnic groups and look at their own family history and examine what is their history, what has been their experience. And, and I think that a, a good teacher uh, would allow for that. You know, I'm, I'm, as, as we sit here and as we discuss, uh, you know, the, the term uh, melting pot, the term melting pot that, that, that became popular in the early 1900s, I believe, uh, by a uh, Jewish playwright, and I forget the name of the play, I don't have the year in front of me. Uh, it, it, he was a Jewish playwright. I think the play may have been in Yiddish. Hmm. Uh, and so if I were to present that, that term melting pot, what was the history of the term, I would point it out. You know, I would point it out where it came from, uh, why it, it, it developed, you know, what was the history of, of uh, immigration before, um, you know, before Eastern European immigration. And, 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 and I think history is so rich. And that's just one example. History is so rich that uh, a good teacher would, would draw upon uh, a full history, and which, which makes an attempt to make the connection, to allow students to make the connections between uh, the experience of the four ethnic groups to their own family history. So we're all aware that the Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum is going to be coming out August 3rd. Um, we understand the stakes feel really high to many communities. Um, is there anything you want to share with this group about the process, about the content, um, what you hope to see in the revised version? Yeah. Well, I think we've gone through the history of the previous process together, Jessica. Uh, yeah. as, as your group brought it to my attention, I immediately shared it uh, with the Department of Education. And as important as ethnic studies is to the state of California, uh, there is no, uh, there will not be another, you know, this is our last chance. This is our last chance to get it right. Um, and it is so crucial that we do get it right. But I have confidence. I have confidence in Tony Thurman. Uh, I have confidence in Linda Darling Hammond, uh, the governor's appointee to the State Board of Education. And the statements that she and Tony and the governor have put out that we will not see a curriculum that is in any way have anything that is anti-Semitic or have a negative stereotypes, not only of Jewish groups, but of any other group for that matter. Uh, and I do have confidence that this second uh, bite at the apple will get it correct. I appreciate very much, as I said at the outset, I appreciate very much the concern in the Jewish community, but I also appreciate, I think what Ty was saying, how important it is that, um, you know, I, uh, growing up Catholic, uh, and, and, and then uh, becoming a part of the uh, Jewish community through marriage, uh, know how much our religious faith uh, directs our politics. And as a student of history, I know the important role that the Jewish community played in the civil rights movement, both uh, for African-Americans and for 
Chicano, Latinos here in the state of California. So because of that history and because of the, the, the knowledge that I have of Jewish faith and of, of uh, welcoming the stranger, it is important to me uh, that we do this together. And that's why I'm very uh, pleased to be here in front of you today to have this discussion. Uh, because at the end of the day, I, I will hope that the Jewish community, as, as Ty indicated, will support ethnic studies with the four pillars and that the Jewish caucus at the end of the day will also do the same. And I, and I would point out that Tony Thurman is right at this time a meeting with the Jewish caucus. Thank you for that. You know, we have a large number of questions coming in, so I wanna make sure we have, um, we have time for as many as possible. Uh, but I do wanna ask a, a closing question, and that is, um, you know, eth unfortunately, the ethnic studies model curriculum discussion has, has um, caused rifts between um, you know, the Jewish community and uh, other ethnic communities. Um, and I, I wonder how do we work together to heal those rifts? Right. Jessica, uh, uh, an important question. But let me also point out that the rift existed before uh, ethnic uh, studies curriculum was, was discussed. Sure. And, and we saw those rifts on campuses, uh, especially on college campuses. You know, we, I, I was part of the discussion uh, with the Jewish caucus and the president of San Francisco State College um, and the problems that existed at San Francisco State College with Jewish students and uh, Jewish organizations uh, not being included. You know, and we saw uh, problems uh, in, on college campuses, um, you know, with students who, who visited Israel not being uh, welcomed in part of student government. So there was a rift, uh, especially on college campuses, between uh, Jewish groups and other groups that existed before the ethnic studies curriculum uh, was being discussed. But there have been efforts uh, of both, I would say, on, on both sides uh, to, to, to work to bring the groups closer together. And, and a couple of instances that I'm aware of, actually, uh, Senator Marty Block and I took part uh, in San Diego with an organization that, in, that existed in San Diego that was a Latino-Jewish dialogue uh, that existed in San Diego. And Senator Block right then uh, chair of the Jewish caucus and I, as a member of the Jewish caucus and the Latino caucus, went to San Diego and met in front of that group, Jews and Latinos to talk about whatever, you know, any, was on any, anyone's mind. Uh, and and that, that, you know, I think that is certainly helpful. In Los Angeles, I, I am very aware of a similar process that brings in young students, I think high school students, um, I, I, I'm aware of it, and now I don't know the name of the group, uh, but, but it brings in, I believe, on weekends, over an extended period of time, uh, again, Latino students with, with Jewish students to just get to know each other better. And, uh, and, and I would say both of those are examples in San Diego and Los Angeles of, of you know, very um, concrete ways that, that um, you know, what, it, it, it's almost uh, to use the phrase to create bridges, not walls. Uh, but but it's important that that happen uh, because sometimes, as we know, communities don't know very much about each other, and it takes work uh, on both sides for communities to know each other better. And and again, that is why I am so honored to be here to be part of this discussion today. And I would I would uh, very much. Uh, you know, say that more of those kind of discussions need to take place. Thank you for that. And so now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Karen Stiller, and she's going to um, provide us with the questions from the audience.
Okay, thank you. We have many, many questions, and I'm going to try to group the questions along thematic lines and um, best interpret the questions people are trying to ask. So um, the first one, um, and we've heard a number of, of questions related to this, and we know that perhaps assembly member, member Medina doesn't necessarily know the answers to this, perhaps our JCRC professionals know, um, but do we know that the original problems with the original draft have been addressed? Um, do we know, for example, that anti the anti-Semitic elements have been removed, that BDS is out um, of the curriculum? And um, in addition to it, what about the political slant and concerns that have been raised about that? Uh, do we know that it's been removed? I, I think, and, and as I said, I do take at their word, uh, both State Superintendent Tony Thurman and Linda Darling Hammond, uh, and the governor, that we won't see anything like the first draft again moving forward. I think that's been made clear what by everyone, and I think Jessica has uh, has indicated correctly that around sometime in early August we will be seeing the new uh, draft which my understanding, um, you know, it took a, a different approach. So it should have different results. Okay. Maybe, maybe I'll just add Others? something to that. Um, the removal of anti-Semitism from the draft is a red line for us. We have every reason to believe that the commitment made by Tony and his staff is a good one. Um, and we'll be checking that the draft reflects those changes. And if not, it's something that we'll communicate with, with all of you. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about next steps at the end of the call, but that is something we would be prepared to continue to, to act on. Um, so just know that that's obviously a key point that we'll be monitoring as the draft comes out. Okay, related to that, um, Assembly member, what kind of oversight will the legislature have um, to ensure that that these issues have been addressed um, after the next um, model curriculum comes out, the next draft? Another, another good question. You know, but as an educator, as an educator and a legislator, I, I would say this, that uh, certainly it is the legislature's uh, job to monitor, um, you know, I, I, I've sat in on a couple of different uh, committee hearings one that we had at Cal State San Bernardino on the state of hate. And that one was convened by uh, assembly member Richard Bloom. And, uh, um, and, and, and it dealt with hate in the United States, with hate, hate crimes in, in California. The other one uh, that I took part in, we had one at UCLA, um, and I'm trying to remember uh, who convened it, but it, 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 it was brought on by students at UCLA uh, talking about, um, you know, uh, different things that I alluded to, problems of Jewish students at UCLA, and we went and, and had a hearing there. So I think the legislature has that role to play, but when it comes to creating curriculum, as an educator, uh, as a student of history, I don't think that, that directly as legislators we, we should be the ones writing the curriculum. I, I don't think so. Uh, I think that, 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 that's the, that would create more problems. So I, I think it is more our role to leave it to the Department of Education as they are doing. Uh, and, and, and I have stepped back uh, from, you know, uh, and I'm not involved in that process. And, and, um, and then um, waiting to see, um, you know, what, what it looks like and, uh, and as I say, um, keeping them, you know, keeping them uh, to their word. And I, I don't think, um, yeah, I, I don't think anyone, as I, as I did in the, in the first uh, iteration, uh, would approve of anything uh, that is less than, than stellar. Thank you. And do you see a role for, um, the Assembly Bill 331, I believe it is, um, in this, in this oversight process? Well, 
so so the bill is is what calls for it being a graduation requirement uh you know certainly they're moving uh, at around the same time uh, the curriculum with the bill um it, it would have been you know uh it would have been nicer or it would have been more convenient had the curriculum uh, been out earlier or sooner uh but uh it it, it isn't and so it's it's going to come pretty close together the two things the ab331 uh, moving forward and the curriculum uh, being uh, released okay let's um let's switch gears a little bit um, and go more to the theoretical so one question you know i've seen a number of people ask is um Ethnic studies, this core, this course is one way to address um, many of the concerns around racial justice in our country right now. But are there other ways to do this uh, within the curriculum? Couldn't um, the, the content of ethnic studies be integrated throughout um, social sciences and other curriculums and um, make a different kind of impact? Right. I think that was a question that that was asked kind of once before uh, already uh, and it is a question you know that comes up often in the discussion um, and maybe I, and again the answer would be yes that would be ideal uh, unfortunately I am now 67 years old and uh, and and like many people um, we're, we're tired of waiting yeah I'll leave it at that you. Again, we've had a number of questions around around broader inclusion of other ethnic groups. So could you address, um, so if the curriculum strictly focuses on the four traditional groups, what about the inclusion of other ethnic groups that have asked to be represented, such as Hindu Americans, Arab Americans, and others? All right. Uh, again, I'm a classroom teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I taught U.S. history, and if, if you're familiar with your U.S. history, uh, if you have, uh, you know, young people, children who are in 11th grade and are taking U.S. history, you know, it's a race. It's a race uh, for the U.S. history teacher to cover everything that happened from the Civil War to the present. And every year there's more and more that, that needs to be taught, right, because every year there's more and more history. So we're talking about a semester class. 18 weeks, and we're talking about four different groups. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot to teach in one semester with four groups. Um, again, African American, Latino, Native American, and Asian American. That's a lot to do in 18 weeks. Uh, we're, we're only going to skim the surface. Uh, so as other other you know groups that you mentioned uh, would maybe want to see them included in there. I, I, I would say that it would be unfair actually uh, to a teacher to try to do more uh, than that. But that doesn't mean that a student couldn't uh, himself herself uh, look at their own individual experience and relate it to that to their individual and family history and 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 many ways uh, that i've seen and i i would point people to uh, uh authored by the name of james banks he's from the university of washington and his book on teaching ethnic studies which is i think a classic it's been around since the 1970s shows an approach to teaching ethnic st studies comparatively and looking at group experiences and comparing them uh, to each other. And, and I think that is a profitable way uh, of, of teaching it and a way that would um, be able to um, shed more light on different groups. And, and relatedly, what would you say to groups that are advocating for the retention of the original draft? We know there's- Well, I, 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 I oh, oh, groups that are advocating for the original draft. No. Nope. Right. No. Nope. No, I, I've said uh, unequivocally that I uh, had many issues 
with the original draft. And uh, anti-Semitism was, was just one of the issues that I had with it. Uh, others had to do with language that was used that I thought uh, was uh, more uh, of a hindrance than, than helpful. So no. <laughs> so this is a question for um, all of our panelists. What should the community do when the new draft comes out? And relatedly, what will JCRC specifically do? I think that's maybe a question better for Ty. Sounds good. So here's, I was gonna close with this, but I'll, I'll address it head on now. Number one, when the draft comes out, our staff will carefully review the, the next drafts. We'll assess whether it's met our goals um, advocating for the four groups, removing anti-Semitism, including a definition of anti-Semitism in forms of hate, and hopefully finding Jewish inclusion. Then we're going to sit with all of our partners, AJC, ADL, Jewish federations, other local and state Jewish agencies across the state that have expressed an interest in advocating for this. And we're going to try to find broad ideological consensus. There are, of course, a number of valid views on how to approach this issue. And it's critical that our community speaks from a shared voice. So our goal is to develop a shared set of principles and a shared response. And depending on what we get, we just don't know what kind of public advocacy is going to be required. We may get a great draft. And, uh, and the main thing we're doing is writing thank you letters. We may need to mobilize the community or something in between. So hold tight. We and our partners will communicate with all of you what next steps are needed. But it's going to be critical that we maintain and build relationships with school boards across the state because this is going to be implemented on a district by district level and it's going to look different in each place. We're going to need some oversight and we're going to need to continue to educate school board members and other elected officials both about anti-Semitism and about what the needs of the Jewish community are around this. So again, we will be in touch with you. We will probably offer more opportunities once we know what's in the draft to do webinars publicly like this. Um, but we will be sure to communicate publicly with all of you in partnership with other agencies that have committed to taking on this issue. Jessica, anything to add? Or that covered it, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm just curious, related, also related to this is, um, we know a lot of this, this teaching doesn't happen in a vacuum. Um, it doesn't happen by members of the legislature, as you pointed out, um, assembly member, or, and it doesn't happen by, um, by the CDE either. It happens in the classroom. And so what can we do um, as a community to support um, a, a positive ethnic studies curriculum at the local level, at the district level, um, at the classroom level? Well, um, good question. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, involvement, right? I think uh, a Thai, uh, you know, involvement in, in the schools and all, and pre, I, I would say in, in all aspects. Um, she's not on board right now, but, uh, you know, a, a co-teacher of mine, colleague, uh, Rosalind Jones, uh, taught right below me. And Rosalind was also a member of Temple Bethel our children grew up together. And, and I will just say that Roz, as, as we called her Roz, uh, every, any time that back to school night would, would uh, coincide with High Holy Days or any other Jewish uh, holiday, uh, would, would, you know, would, would say, you know, how, how is that possible? You know, why, why are schools doing that? Uh, my own daughter, when I think she was in kindergarten, the first grade, first grade, and uh, the teacher gave her, you know, something on Santa Claus or something to color. And she, she told the teacher as a first grader, no, I, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not coloring that. Um, you know, it's, so it's an ongoing, I think it's an ongoing um, discussion with schools, uh, not, not only about ethnic studies, but, um, but everything else. Uh, and, and I am very clear that uh, anti-Semitism uh, is, is, you know, on the rise, unfortunately, as other hate crimes are in the United States. And, and like racism, uh, it, it is, needs to be called out every time it's seen. 
and so that that would be uh, you know and I think that's what uh, I'm sure the community is doing already but that that's what needs to continue to happen okay thank you I think we're getting close to um, the end of the Q&A period um, and um, I am wondering if there are any issues that have not been brought up related to this curriculum that folks would um, on the panel would like to address. Not necessarily completely about the curriculum, but about ethnic studies in general. Um, just sitting here reflecting on um, what Jose has talked about, about his family. Um, my family has a similar makeup of uh, Latinos and Jews. And just reflecting on how uh, our Jewish community can honor um, people of Jews of color in our community by supporting um, ethnic studies and ensuring that it has um, a, a strong content so that they have the ability to, um, to really learn about themselves in, in the public school setting. Well, um, I, I think we're getting close to the end, sounds like. I, I, I would say thank you very much and grateful for this discussion. And, uh, you know, I, I think ethnic studies, um, good ethnic studies will move uh, all communities forward. And I'm reminded of JFK's, right? A rising tide lifts all boats. And so as we, uh, even if it's just these four groups uh, attempt to tell a fuller story of this country, I, I think that this will also be a benefit specifically to the Jewish community because uh, as we started, uh, pride in who we are as, as individuals and where we come from uh, is very much um, something that is in that we share in common uh, across those four groups that were mentioned in ethnic studies but certainly uh, a part of as i know of jewish identity as well and uh and we celebrate uh that that identity and that uh that history and as we do it for one one group i think we're doing it for for all groups and it's moving forward which is what we need to do. Thank you so uh, much, Assembly Member. Jessica, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to end with my appreciation um, for Assembly Member Jose Medina um, for all of your leadership on this um, really important issue to our state, um, for taking the time to be with us when we know there's so much going on in the world um, that you as a state legislature are probably very busy, um, and so thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy on this, and um, we'll continue to be in touch and talk about this. Thank you. Look forward to it. Thank you. Before, thank everyone, you. before everyone signs off, I just want to say we'll be in touch once we hear the draft. We'll be in touch with the next steps and our assessment of the draft as it meets our goals. But I also want to remind people this is a long-term process. This is not where the work stops or starts. Um, and there will be more work to do on the local and state level. This is a long-term concern. The other thing is, of course, there are other ways for us to combat anti-Semitism in this moment. I saw a lot of comments about anti-Semitism from the left in addition to the right. We have an opportunity to bring local and state elected officials and civic leaders to Israel. JCRC also does workshops for staff and civic leaders and elected officials to educate them about anti-Semitism and the things that celebrate Jewish community. We have other tools in our shed to combat this problem. This is not our only avenue to do so. While it is, of course, an important one, we have other ways of doing so. And finally, our ability to advocate for these other communities, especially during COVID, especially with, you know, Black lives under threat, that is not only about Jewish values, that's about our own security. As we face new challenges to our democracy, our ability to stand up for our neighbors is also in our best interest in combating anti-Semitism and threats to Jews. So that's why it's so important we stick up for one another. 
As you said, JFK's quote is a perfect segue. So I wanna thank everyone for joining. This is just the beginning of the conversation around this and we'll be in touch very soon. So thank you all for being here and enjoy the rest of your day.